conspiracies, endless wars, hidden forbidden history, the depopulation agenda, cryptozoology, mystical visions, hidden mysteries, advanced subterranean civilizations, flying saucers, alien abductions, and secret space programs, time travel, wellness, and healthy living. Where do you go to find out about these subjects and more? To James Barley's Cosmic Switchboard Show. That's where... James Barley will provide cutting-edge information and will interview the top investigators and researchers in a variety of fields. Listen in every week to the Cosmic Switchboard Show, hosted by James Bartley. Again, everybody, this is James Bartley. You are listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. My very special guest today is Tom Montauk, a noted researcher into uh, the alien contact phenomena, hyperdimensional matrix phenomena, uh, and a number of other subjects. His website is Montauk.net, and we're very pleased here at the Cosmic Switchboard to have him as our guest. So without any further ado, uh, Tom Montauk, are you there? Hi, James. Yes, I am. Thanks for having me on. Hi, Tom. Uh, for the benefit of those listeners who uh, are not familiar with you or your work, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm the author of a website called Transcending the Matrix Control System. And my background is in physics and electrical engineering, but my main focus is actually in researching and writing about some of the more fundamental problems and mysteries of our world. So... Mysteries like how mind affects matter, uh, the nature of synchronicities, the alien agenda, um, secret societies in the New World Order, human origins, and ancient history regarding things like the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail, and you know, and also like science-oriented subjects like scalar physics, time travel, hyperdimensional technology, etheric energy, and uh, I've gotten a bit into alchemy as well. So I've, I've had some alien abduction experiences uh, with uh, non-human beings ever since I was a little kid, and um, even though I only remember a fragment of it, it uh, piqued my curiosity into these subjects from a very, very young age. So, you know, I had a really curious mind, and I was confronted with these really strange uh, experiences that I couldn't really make sense of, so I spent most of my life trying to figure out what was actually going on. And uh, thanks to my website, you know, over the years I've had literally thousands of correspondences with other truth seekers, and uh, with lots of other experiencers who have also shared with me their anecdotes and their findings. And all of this, you know, I correlate together with my own experiences and my own research to try to come up with a, uh, you know, a concise summary of what might be going on in each area, which I then turn into an article and post on my website for free for you all to read. So that's sort of what I'm into, and I hope you guys can check out my site because there's so much material there, and in this show I can only cover a small, small little snippet of it. Yes, your, your website is required reading for anybody going through uh, the the alien abduction phenomena, alien encounters, hyperdimensional interference, and so forth. I know back in the day, just when when I was first getting on the internet, <clears throat> a lot of us uh, would kind of wait with bated breath for you know your next article to come out. It was like, hey, did you hear? Did you read that latest article from Montauk? What do you think about it? Yeah, it was pretty cool. We get a general discussion going, and so you know a lot of us kind of really looked up to, and admired you from afar, right? And so. Here you are today, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. Some of your articles uh, in the past uh, are are really informative as far as the alien uh, contact phenomena is concerned. Subjects, uh, topics like discerning alien disinformation, parts one through six, uh, synopsis of the alien master plan. Uh, and then one of my favorite articles you wrote some time ago was the one about organic negative portals, which... <laughs> Uh, is about basically people who are organic negative portals. Now, y your most recent article uh, is called The uh, Occult Mimicry of a the Alien Phenomena, uh, one of the key aspects uh, of which basically is that some of these entities uh, that are not aliens masquerade as aliens for some specific purpose or, or a series uh, of, uh, of purposes to kind of fool people into thinking they're having alien encounters. I think that's, it's, in this day and age, it's important to, 
differentiate between alien encounters and something mimicking alien encounters. Do you want to talk about a bit about the, what this occult entity deception is, this occult mimicry of alien uh, contact? Right, right, yeah. As you mentioned, the, the article is called uh, The Occult Mimicry of Alien Contact, and it's an article that I submitted to the Journal of Abduction Research, and it's in there right now on their website. Um, but the reason why I wrote it is because I noticed over the years um, people contacting me, telling me their various experiences, and I noticed that there was this general pattern happening with a segment of them where it seemed like they were being contacted by alien beings who were telling them, you know, stories about the, the galactic history and their role in it and all this kind of stuff, but it had all the other symptoms and signs of a paranormal, like a cult, uh, almost like a possession or haunting type of thing, and it didn't have any of the traits that you would normally expect from an alien contactee or abductee uh, type phenomenon. So it occurred to me that perhaps there were these so-called occult entities that were mimicking it. So, yeah, so the subject of my article is about non-alien entities, such as ghosts or demons or what occultists might call astral parasites, who use telepathic methods to induce voices or hallucinations in vulnerable individuals. Now, these hallucinations, you know, they can, um, they can take the form of an alien being or a, uh, a faked abduction, or they can take the form of um, some sort of fantastic space adventure that the person is put through. But the thing is, it's all happening in the victim's own mind, you know, in their own beds. So they're not actually even going anywhere. They're not actually being physically abducted by anything. And, um, you know, the victim might think that he's in touch with aliens or, you know, in some cases it could be a spirit guide or an archangel or whatever works on that particular person that fits his belief system. Um, but, in fact, it's actually these paranormal parasites that are putting on a hallucinatory, uh, hallucinatory show of sorts. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a problem for a couple of reasons. One is that this stuff is way more common than alien abductions. And a lot of people, at least the ones that have contacted me, a lot of people seem to be preyed on by these types of entities. Um, you know, I get a couple of emails every month from new people who seem to be experiencing this. And uh, compared to that, I get far fewer emails which suggest a genuine alien abduction thing happening in their lives. So, you know, it just kind of makes me wonder just how widespread this phenomenon actually is. I mean, it's likely that a chunk of those who are being diagnosed as schizophrenic may actually be cases of, uh, you know, this kind of occult predation going on. And uh, you know, these people are getting misdiagnosed because, as we all know, the medical system doesn't believe anything, anything paranormal or occult, so they're kind of lumping everything together under one general category, which is wrong. And, you know, these people, they could be leading normal, happy lives, but they're getting run ragged by these occult entities, and their lives are getting totally ruined. And even worse... <laughs> Some of them, they, they become experts in the BS that these entities are feeding them. It's like they get yes. loaded up. Yeah, they get loaded up in their heads with a grand story about this is how reality is. This is what's going on. There's these beings and those beings and those beings and those beings and those are fighting those beings. And so, you know, but the thing is, almost all of it is fabricated or drawn from the victim's own subconscious. Okay. And, you know, this is bad because, <laughs> well... In some cases, these people become experts, and then they go out and they start teaching it. They become gurus. They become channelers. And all that does is it creates an audience for those same entities to start feeding on those people. And it spreads, you know, almost like, a, like, a, like an occult virus going around. And that's really unfortunate. So, you know, that's one problem. Another problem is, uh, which is the main point of my article, is that ufology and abduction research, you know, it relies heavily on what abductees and contactees themselves remember and what they say about what they've experienced. So if some of these experiencers were actually receiving like fictional hallucinations induced by occult entities, then pretty much none of what those people can say is necessarily indicative or reflective of what aliens are like or what they're really up to. So, you know, it's a source of noise that gets in the way of the signal that we're looking for when it comes to uh, alien research. And um, so we have to be wary of that so that we don't contaminate our our, our database, you know, of, of what information we have on aliens. Can you talk a bit more about what these occult entities are, uh, what they are, perhaps where they come from, and, and how they differ from aliens, how a person going through this can differentiate them between what you describe as an occult entity and a real alien? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really important question because, well, because, I mean, we know people who believe that, um, well, people that don't make a distinction between aliens and occult entities, right? They either think that all aliens are really demons in disguise or that uh, demons and angels and like the jinn of myth and religion, 
that they were really aliens who were, you know, being misperceived as such by ancient superstitious people. So, you know, it's, it's there's just too much um, simplification going on there. And what we really need to do is we need to realize that it's not that simple. That, you know, it's not that all demons are aliens or all aliens are demons. It's, it's you, know, you can have both. They're not mutually exclusive. You know, and I think that anyone who deals with enough alien and occult activity in life will, over time, they'll be able to pick up on the various nuances that distinguish them. Um, for example, a friend of mine that I've known for a couple of years, he's an alien contactee and he's a clairvoyant, right? And he's been able to directly perceive uh, occult entities and aliens since he was a kid. So he's acquired a lot of uh, experience, which adds up to a lot of inside information on how these beings operate. And um, for him, you know, aliens are not the same thing as ghosts or demons necessarily. Well, I mean, I mean, at least they're not any more than humans are like jellyfish. You know, <laughs> humans and jellyfish are both animals, but they're quite different. So, you know, the same can be said for, for uh, aliens and the whole cult entity phenomenon. So, you know, his material, along with uh, the correspondences I've had with others, along with the works of authors like Robert Bruce, who else? Uh, Rudolf Steiner, Robert Monroe. Uh, John Keel, Carla Turner, and you, James, and Eve Oregon as well, and, you know, countless others. That's where I'm drawing all of, this, all of this information from. You know, just in case anyone's wondering why why I've come to believe uh, this hypothesis. So, all right, so uh, back to your question here. Um, let's first discuss aliens, and then I'll get into how occult entities are different from them. So aliens, you know, as we all know, they're non-terrestrial beings with uh, superhuman intelligence, and they appear to have real technology. So they may have telepathic powers, they may be able to shift between dimensions, maybe even travel through time, and they can also phase themselves through solid objects, and they can take abductees and levitate them out through you know, closed windows and solid walls and everything. So as to alien origins, uh, some of them seems like they come from other dimensions, some maybe from other timelines, maybe from the future, uh, from other planets. But, you know, these, these possibilities, are not, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have all these possibilities because, as we know, aliens are quite uh, varied in how they look and how they behave and, and so on. So, you know, it's not correct to necessarily say they only come from one time or one place or, you know, that they're all strictly nothing but interdimensional tricksters and so on. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that aliens seem to be primarily tangible beings, you know, like us, in a sense. In the, in, in the sense that they have bodies, they have ships and bases, that they use technology... You know, and presumably that they require food and shelter of some kind, and, you know, perhaps that they even bleed and die like us. So, from a metaphysical point of view, you could say that aliens are incarnated beings. Well, at least the ones who aren't, like, organic robotoids, like some of the greys, of course. Yes. Yeah, so, as far as occult entities go, on the other hand, uh, they would be what we consider discarnate beings. They're not incarnated into bodies. They are outside the body because they don't have a body. <laughs> I mean, they're just disembodied souls that are roaming around uh, what the occultists would call the etheric or the astral plane, which is like a subtle energy field that, you know, uh, it permeates our entire universe and um, also exists outside, you know, our tangible reality. So this is sort of where they, where they uh, situate themselves. But they can come close to physicality and they can interact with us under certain conditions. But the important thing here is that because they don't have biological bodies, their requirements for survival are... Um, a lot simpler than those of aliens. All they really seem to require is our vital energies, uh, our, our emotional energies, our spiritual energies, in order to give themselves a, a degree of occult power and uh, coherence. Okay, So their main drives seem to be energy feeding and control, first and foremost. And the more malicious ones, uh, they also seem to be in it to uh, corrupt and destroy our connection to spirit. So you know, there's a very evil malevolence to some of them, which, um, generally speaking, you know, aliens can be pretty, uh, I want to say bastardy, but yeah, that's, that's the correct <laughs> word for it, right? But, but the thing is, demons are evil on a, on a whole other, whole other level, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, it's because they don't have bodies that, uh, you know, they have no need for technology, for science, for ships and bases, you know, from a shelter from the physical elements or specialized uniforms and none of that stuff. They don't need that. And because of the simplicity, uh, they haven't had to adapt in the same way that aliens have had to. So they're generally not as smart or as sophisticated as aliens can be. I mean, compared to aliens, 
uh, you know, they have a smaller skill set in terms of, let's say, psychic abilities and manipulation of the human mind. But, um, you know, they can also, they also cannot do things that aliens take for granted, like uh, interbreeding with humans. They can't generate hybrid offspring, uh, and they can't, like, genetically engineer a new physical race, like aliens can. Uh, they can also not make deals with the government or military in the <laughs> sense, in sense of giving them advanced technology in exchange for, you know, cooperation. And most of all, they can't abduct people physically, you know, where, where, the, where the person goes missing for hours or days at a time and uh, returns with scars and scoop marks and physical implants. So in my experience, you know, the closest that occult entities can come to any of this is basic poltergeist activity and, let's say, leaving bruises or welts on the skin, you know, which is uh, pretty common in cases of possession and, and haunting and, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, those all come from an occult entity gaining enough etheric energy to begin affecting physical matter, which then allows them to, like, let's say, disrupt blood vessels uh, and, and then the body's own biological chemistry. So, you know, if you get hit hard by a demon, um, typically you would feel, let's say, a cold metallic chill. You'd feel nausea, maybe sweating. Um, you know, these are symptoms of having been etherically poisoned, you know, as your, your aura has been contaminated by its, its dark energies, and maybe it even siphoned some of your energy. And so these entities can affect us physically and biologically. But the thing is, um, you know, and, and they can even move objects as seen in, in uh, haunted houses and stuff, but that's nothing compared to what aliens can do. I mean, aliens can disable cars. They can manipulate time to a degree. Uh, they can erase memories and install fake screen memories. I mean, how, they can disable nuclear weapons, for crying out loud, right? And occult entities just really can't compare to that. But that said, occult entities are still a huge problem because... There are just so many of them, and they seem to be everywhere. And, uh, you know, an alien might visit an abductee once every few months or years, but an occult entity can set up shop and hang out 24-7, like, like some kind of a vermin infestation or something. Now, why, why is that? Like, why would occult entities still be a big problem if, enti- if aliens seem to be more powerful and more capable? Well, take ghosts, for example, right? One figure I'd, I came across um, before I came on the show is that since the dawn of the human race, there have been around 108 billion lives lived. So that's, that's the accumulation of different human lives that have lived and died. So that's 108 billion deaths. Now the question is, how many of those deaths went on to, let's say, reincarnate and, or do whatever and go elsewhere, but how many went astray and became, let's say, stragglers hanging around the earth plane as ghosts, right? Mm. Out of 108 billion, I'm sure even if it's 1%, that's a heck of a lot. That's a heck of a lot of of ghosts, I guess you could say. Um, And of those, how many of them were some really evil, psychopathic, twisted types who somehow learned how to feed off a living in order to sustain their form? And again, probably it's it's quite a bit, you know? So point being that there's been plenty of time and plenty of deaths since uh, the dawn of humanity for the uh, etheric and astral planes that surround us to become littered with, you know, various types of occult deviants and degenerates who who now function as uh, parasites and tormentors of living people. <laughs> and these are just one class of occult entities, which I would call dark ghosts. All right? And then it's also known in occultism that our strongest thoughts and our strongest emotions can create, uh, I mean, it can go into the astral and etheric planes and create their what are called thought forms. Uh, they also are known as tulpas or egregores. All right? And in the etheric and astral planes, these are like metaphysical bubbles of energy that... Um, it can, they can take temporary en- entitized form there. And then these, these, these astral parasites, which are temporarily generated by our thoughts and emotions, can come back to the person and manipulate that person into generating more of the same energies. Okay? So, for example, if a person gives into some extreme thoughts and feelings of hatred, in some cases it might generate a subtle energy construct that takes the form in the shape of an etheric or astral being that latches onto him like a parasite and then tries to induce more of the same. And in this way, the thought form grows larger and larger and can even begin feeding off of the people. So if you multiply that times time, over time, you can also get these thought forms, which are generated by humans, that um, seem to have a mind of their own and which function as uh, parasitic occult entities. Um, Actually, there was a movie. There was a weird movie a couple years ago called Branded. It's a very strange movie. But it's a movie called Branded, and it tries to depict this whole phenomenon of of thought forms. Except for, you know, it kind of framed it in context of uh, different corporations and brands um, generating thought forms in order to manipulate the, 
their customers into buying more of that you know particular brand. But anyway, it's an interesting movie, but a strange one. So go check it out if you are interested in that. It's called Branded. Anyway, um, so over time, these thought forms and these astral parasites can become so powerful that they, together with uh, some of the most evil of these deceased dark humans, and possibly even deceased aliens, well, I know, they together are probably what constitute what we would call demons. So, you know, the, the whole demon stuff, um, if, I, if someone had to ask me what are demons, I would say that they're a combination of the entitized thought forms of humanity and uh, really dark and twisted uh, deceased humans and possibly aliens as well. So that's, that's what we need to keep in mind regarding aliens and uh, occult entities and the difference between them. Now, for someone who's going through this kind of process uh, unwittingly, can you go into detail about how this process plays itself out uh, in the lives of an individual or in, in a group of people, perhaps? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. So this is based on the hundreds of emails that I've gotten over the years where I kind of collected them into a folder. So I've got like a folder of all these different cases and I went through and I looked at all the common elements that seems to be going on. And, you know, I've kind of come up with a, a general pattern. So I'm going to go through and describe for you what typically happens. I mean, there's different variations of it, but you'll get an idea from, from how I describe it. So, all right. So the first step is where the entities make contact. Okay. They can either reach out to you or you can inadvertently or intentionally reach out to them. You reaching out to them would be like, uh, let's say, um, Ouija board sessions, uh, black magic rituals, magical invita- uh, invocations, and, uh, and also people who try to channel. And also like some of the people that make the mistake of making packs with demons. I can't believe people do that. <laughs> I can't believe people do that, but they do, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah they, they do. So, <laughs> you know, and, that, and that sort of stuff. So, so uh, oh, actually, yeah, another good example would be if you go outside and look up at the night sky and you broadcast a really strong mental message that you desperately want to meet aliens, <laughs> then that broadcast can be heard not only by alien factions that are monitoring the area, but they can also be heard by any sort of occult entity that might be around. And you don't necessarily know who might jump on that opportunity. And, and that's really bad because next thing you know, you think you're getting contacted by aliens, but really it's some paranormal entity who realized you were a naive, gullible, desperate sucker and he's now feeding, you know, these false uh, voices and stories and manipulated dreams into you. And, you know, before you know it, you're going out there on the talk circuits, you know, <laughs> giving a whole galactic history of, <laughs> of the universe. And uh, it's, it's not correct information, so you've got to be careful for that kind of thing. When they reach out to you versus you reaching out to them, uh, it happens in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is that they can appear in a dream as a recurring character or a group of beings. You know, they can come night after night you know, build a relationship with you. And because it's a dream, it's even easier for them to disguise their true nature because they can project uh, they can project any form they want in a dream, right? Uh, they can do that. They can also pop into a person's mind in the form of a vision. Uh, that happens quite a bit. Um, other times they manifest almost directly uh, in more of their true form as a shadowy figure in the room, you know, that uh, stands there and speaks to you or communicates into your mind. Uh, another one is that they can swirl overhead as you're going to sleep and project a voice down into your mind. That's happened a couple times. And uh, what else? Oh, and they can also induce the initial hallucination while you're relaxing. Um, Let's say you're on a deck chair out on your your deck, and you're looking up at the sky, and you're relaxing, and some occult entity notices the moment of psychic vulnerability, and before you know it, you start seeing some weird crafts in the sky. But really, it's actually a a hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucination that they're inducing. You think it's up in the sky, but it's actually not. It's, it's happening in your in your own mind. And if that works, and if you become really curious, and then you go out looking for them more and more, um, that then begins uh, leading to the next step, which is that they pique your interest. That's the second step after initially reaching out to you and making contact. They have to catch your, your interest. They have to make you become uh, preoccupied. So, yeah, they need you to want more of that experience and to become fixated on them, and ultimately, you know, to give more and more permission because, you know, from an occult perspective, uh, it's all about free will. You know, that is what allows these entities to sidestep some of the, uh, some of the metaphysical protection that we naturally have. I mean, keep in mind that these entities can't do this overt stuff to, to just anyone, right? It's, it's only certain people with certain vulnerabilities that get targeted. And, um, and then how bad it gets kind of depends on how much of their free will that they end up giving away to these entities. So anyway, at that point, you know, the next phase would be that these sensations, uh, these voices, visions, and, and dreams, 
that they become increasingly vivid and like visceral as the entity gains more and more control over the person and begins hijacking the person's, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the part of their subtle energy field that interfaces with their, uh, with their nervous system, um, they, they end up splicing their own signal into that and injecting their own uh, signal into that pathway, and that's how the person ends up experiencing these audiovisual, you know, kinesthetic hallucinations. Uh, yeah, so sometimes um, these entities, sometimes they're just all right with just having some sort of a crude auditory or visual control, uh, which, which would be the case, let's say, with a channeler or like a medium under the influence of these occult entities who, uh, a channeler who might only need to relay the basic message or kind of interpret the vague sensations and impressions that they receive. So in that case, then the occult entity doesn't have to have full-blown 100%, you know, audiovisual control of the person, just, you know, just, just dropping little tidbits in there, and then that's enough. Um, other people, though, <laughs> uh, some other people, unfortunately, the entities can get so deep that, um, you know, it pretty much gives them hallucinations all day long, like a, like a constantly running movie that runs alongside real life. And, uh, you know, some of these people, um, it gets so bad that they're tortured and they're played with and they're fed upon by these beings pretty much all hours of the day, you know, so feeling like, like they're getting poked and prodded and pinched. Uh, some people have even mentioned feeling like they're getting electrocuted or raped and, you know, and they feel like there's nothing they can do. And usually when I hear from these people, they're the ones that are at the end of this process. And that's, that's when they're almost goners because at that point, um, not only have they given away so much of their personal spiritual power, but these entities have really sunk some deep roots into that person's uh, etheric energy field. So that's really unfortunate when that happens. And in those cases, I've only seen a very, very small handful of people able to make it back from there. But yeah, at the end of this, um, at the end of this uh, show, I'll give some, um, I'll give some advice, you know, which anyone can apply to get out of it, you know, if, if they're willing to. Yeah. So my final point there would be that the, um, that these occult entities, they can either be openly sadistic and vicious, uh, or they can play sweet and engage in a more drawn-out game of deception. I'm hoping that everyone listening checks out this 2015 documentary called The Nightmare. It's a fascinating documentary about people who experience night terrors and uh, sleep paralysis. And, you know, they're on camera sharing their experiences, and then actors are kind of reenacting what they're describing. <laughs> so it's kind of cool seeing these, these occult entities doing their thing. You know, it's, it's fictionally depicted, but... Uh, but it's, it's a really cool scene because I haven't seen any other documentary that gets into that. I mean, that's only one, one category of it because obviously if the entities put on a, a nice front and appear as, you know, Commander Ashtar or Jesus Christ or something, then the victim won't feel terrified. So those kinds of people are not going to be making it into a documentary like that. But the documentary is about the people who are getting the more sadistic and vicious kind of occult entities. And watching that documentary, uh, which again is called The Nightmare, by, uh, it's directed by Rodney Asher. It's worth a watch to get an idea of what these beings are like. So, yeah, go check that out, too. How do these entities choose their victims? Does there seem to be some kind of criteria? To do the people going through these experiences seem to kind of fall into certain kind of patterns or some kind of, some kind of identifiable, identifiable profile? Right. And, and what are these entities ultimately trying to accomplish? Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, not everyone is targeted, so you have to have some sort of mental or psychic or spiritual vulnerability that these entities can pick up on and then begin exploiting. So, yeah, so who is the target then, right? Well, you have those who have been, let's say, spiritually weakened by heavy drug and alcohol abuse. Now, drugs and alcohol, I mean, alcohol in moderation is fine, but uh, heavy use of that stuff, it can really screw with your aura big time, and it makes it easier for entities to gain an etheric foothold into your uh, subtle energy field. So, like, um, I mentioned entities setting up shop in a place and, you know, being there 24-7. Well, you know, certain kinds of bars are a good example of that because uh, there's so much um, drinking going on there and, and other things that these entities can kind of just hang out and feed off the energy. So that, that's an example of that. And plus, you know, the people are more, more vulnerable due, their, due to their altered state of mind. So, yeah, so people who have their aura uh, chemically disturbed, I guess you could say. Uh, they're ones that are at increased risk of this. So that's one example. Uh, another type of target consists of, um, of those who have been like traumatized in life. Now, trauma, it can lead to uh, what's known as soul fragmentation, which uh, in severe cases leads to dissociation and multiple personality disorder. And, uh, well, the reason why that is is because when the soul is damaged like that, the voids or the cracks left behind in that soul can become infected, so to speak, by these astral parasites. 
So, you know, the person may not be all there due to some of their soul being um, uh, compartmentalized or uh, fragmented away, but something else is there taking that place instead. You know, so wherever there's a void, something else can kind of take up root there or, or act, act through that sort of vulnerability. Um, and, and I've known people myself who, who had some pretty severe trauma and soul fragmentation. And yeah, it's interesting that because mentally they weren't there all the time, but something else was there instead. And, you know, there would be this glint in their eye, like some other entity had resonance in their body, and it would kind of come through from time to time. So those kinds of people would also be uh, vulnerable to, this, to uh, occult entity, entity deception. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. Another type are those who are basically born with a natural ability to, um, to easily slip into sleep paralysis. And that is um, what that means is their mind stays awake while their body falls asleep. So normally, you know, normally the mind falls asleep, too, when you go to sleep and eventually starts to dream, but the problem is, if the mind stays awake, then it can experience that whole process whereby the soul starts to detach from the body, and, you know, that's, that's what the process is when we actually go to sleep. And in that slight out-of-body state, if you're, if you're aware during that moment, you can bypass some of the physical senses and begin perceiving through your etheric eyes and your etheric ears. And that's what these entities look for and count on, since when a person is in that state, um, these entities can more easily appear to that person and feed in voices and so on and basically, you know, scare the living hell out of such people and begin working them over. So people that have natural disposition towards sleep paralysis would naturally uh, also be more likely to uh, encounter such beings. I mean, these beings are around us anyway normally, but, you know, if you're not psychic and you, know, you go to sleep right away, you're not going to notice them necessarily all the time. All right, so another factor is when a person is highly reactive or neurotic or easily spooked. You know, not only... Are such people broadcasting a fear frequency that these entities seem to smell like, you know, like a, like a shark smells blood? But from a metaphysical point of view, uh, there's also something to be said about the law of attraction, where what you resonate with, you know, you kind of help to enhance and pull into your life. So the really, really scared and frightened people, they tend to attract things to an unusual degree that uh, ends up scaring them even more. And, uh, you know, the same can be said for extremely gullible people. They also seem to attract that which perpetuates their gullibility. In other words, you know, they, they pull in deceivers and manipulators and abusers and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's another factor. Um, one more is uh, those who are psychically sensitive. So if you're psychic, you know, if you're clairvoyant, then that means you can more easily see or feel or perceive these entities. And, you know, that unfortunately likewise means that they can more easily interact with you and thus deceive or bother you or, you know, uh, preoccupy you, I guess you could say. So typically, what we find is that a victim of occult entity deception is some combination of what I just mentioned. You know, they could be, let's say, they could be someone with a, a natural psychic ability who's had trauma in life, uh, who is easily spooked, you know, someone neurotic, who has a degree of gullibility about them, maybe, and who suffers also from sleep paralysis. So if you take all these things and you put them together, that's like the perfect storm for these entities to come in and... Uh, you know, and cause problems. So, in cold entities, it seems like they can sense such weaknesses, and, and maybe they're even reading the mind or the soul of the person in order to tailor what they're going to do. You know, they're going to tailor the storylines, they're going to tailor the methods to whatever works best on that particular person and his or her uh, vulnerabilities and, and predispositions. And the goal of all that, of course, as you, um, as I mentioned earlier, was total spiritual subjugation and energy feeding. So that's what they're going for. Do you think perhaps uh, we live in an era of psychiatric tyranny where we have these psychologists and psychiatrists running amok in society, pushing all these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, all these psych meds? Uh, I've spoken to people who talk about how once they started taking a certain kind of psych drug, it seemed like their frequency was lowered and they were able to see into the lower astral realms and pretty soon... Well, perhaps these, these entities were around them all the time, all along to begin with, but now that they're on these meds, suddenly they can see them, and these entities start messing with them. Do, do you think that might play a role in this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and the reason, well, the thing is that happens also with drugs, like, uh, you know, LSD, oh, yes. marijuana. Oh, God, I, have a I know so many cases where someone took a drug, let's say like a heavy dose of marijuana, they didn't react well to it, and while they were on it, they started uh, having paranoid feelings just because that's what some of these drugs do, right? In this paranoid state, they started thinking certain really paranoid lines of reasoning, certain lines of paranoid logic, like, oh, my roommate's putting poison in my milk, or 
oh, my roommate's a, an alien hybrid or something, you know, something like that. And then when they come out of the drug, and they come out, and even though the drug wears off, that line of logic still remains. And this is this is something only slightly related to the, to the occult entity thing, but I figured I should mention it. Uh, but the point being that these people then start going down this road towards what seems like paranoid schizophrenia solely because it all started with a really bad drug trip that you know whose psychological effects still lingered um, after the chemical effect has worn off. Back to what you said about these um, these psychiatric drugs being given. Uh, you know, one thing you have to keep in mind is that these these occult entities, some of the demons are extremely smart, actually. They're, they're, I mean, they might not be as capable as aliens, but they're quite crafty. And uh, there's people walking around us who seem to be almost 100% hosts uh, being possessed by these dark entities. And who knows how many of them have integrated into positions of social influence and power, uh, even in the medical fields, and have done things either knowingly or unknowingly that end up uh, helping uh, this dark, demonic agenda, right? It's very plausible that, you know, things in our diet, uh, the psychiatric drugs that are being pumped out, that part of that does serve, you know, not only a pharmaceutical money-making type purpose, but also uh, a darker demonic agenda, you know, uh, lowering people's vibrations and getting them more easily interfaced with by these entities. So, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a huge, huge thing to, to be looking out for. I would also imagine that um, many people that are subject to archontic uh, malign influence, they suffer uh, varying degrees of uh, OCD, of, uh, you know, these these obsessive compulsive thought loops. And I, I'm just guessing, having a guess, that some of these occult entities may also do something like that, like just put these paranoid thoughts into people just to have it bounce around in their heads like, a, like an echo chamber. Yeah, that's pretty easy to do, and I've experienced that myself back in 2000 and 2001 when I first started getting into researching the whole matrix control system idea. Um, part of that research in, involved um, synchronicities. Because you know, synchronicities, yes. when, you, when, you have, when you have a synchronicity, that's, and you have enough of them, there's no way you can go back to believing that this world is just a, a deterministic machine like science says, right? You can, you can sense that there must be some intelligence that's working through your environment, you know, through uh, time itself to send you these messages. And, and, you know, while synchronicities can be good and can be useful, uh, there's, a, there's an aberrant version of that, which if a person isn't careful, they can really, really put them into a paranoid mindset. And like I said, put them on that pathway down towards what seems like paranoid schizophrenia. In regards to, in regards to what you're talking about, and that's an interesting point because occult entities, you know, they might not have total control of your audiovisual system enough to, like, let's say, hijack your your visual system and create visual hallucinations, but they can still put in, I mean, they can, well, they can easily uh, create a feeling of dread or fear in a person. And they can also drop in like little thought nuggets into your subconscious uh, just to, just to kick off uh, a suspicion. And generally it's people who don't have much self-awareness and they don't really question their own thoughts that are most easily manipulated by this, right? It's almost like they're trying to build a fire, right? You know, they, they light a spark and then they fan the flames and then the person provides his or her own fuel to keep that flame going. So if a person starts off with a paranoid thought loop, which isn't his or her own, right, uh, and they buy into it, then they start reinforcing it. And then these entities, all they have to do is just, you know, pump it up a little bit here and there, and before you know it, the person's a total basket case. <laughs> and what makes it even worse is that whole uh, law of attraction idea, the idea that your mind and your emotions have some sort of probabilis probabilistic influence over reality. If you're extremely fearful and really paranoid, then that's actually going to increase the probability of something happening that seems to confirm that fear and that paranoia. And that's another thing that these entities seem to count on, is to use that person's own divinely given power of creation against them by getting them to create a hell for themselves. So that's why it's so important that people that are caught up in this kind of stuff, uh, that they break this feedback loop, you know, this, this, this thing where fear generates more terroring, uh, terrorizing events, which then creates more fear and so on. Uh, they need to put a stop to it, and I'll get in, into that in a bit. But yeah, that whole thing about OCD thought loops, um, yeah, that, that, is, that is one of the most efficient methods that these entities have for uh, siphoning our energies and driving an otherwise promising life into uh, utter ruin and destruction. That's a very good point. Now, in, you're familiar in the, in the UFO alien field. Uh, Dr. Carla Turner used to always talk about this, how... Uh, the aliens, the various alien groups, would give a particular 
uh, story to a given individual or group of people, uh, usually having to do with some kind of futuristic event, some big event that was coming down the pike. And Candy Turner made, made a joke about it. You know, first the aliens said, oh, in 1994, it's going to be big, it, something's coming, and then 1994 comes and goes and nothing happens. And then the aliens say, oh, 1999, that's when we're going to reveal ourselves. That's when everything's going to change. We're going to have full disclosure, et cetera, et cetera. But 1999 comes and goes and nothing happens. So aliens are well known for giving false stories to contactees and abductees. Uh, do you see, do you discern the same pattern going on with these occult entities mimicking aliens? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the goals between aliens and occult entities, it's similar, but it's also different, and, and I'll get into that. And the, the reason why that is is because you know, occult entities, they're primarily concerned with consuming your vital energies and to control or destroy the divine light that is within us. So their fake stories um, that they give, they're, they're more like props you know, and excuses to gain our cooperation and our submission for the purposes of their energy feeding. So the directionality of their false storylines, it points more towards um, the poisoning of the soul, spiritual disinformation, and uh, preoccupation with what's basically a big, big pile of lies. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more simple, and it's, it's oriented more towards you know, polluting the soul and destroying the spirit and that kind of stuff. Aliens, on the other hand, uh, they're in it more for long-term strategy, which is to manipulate our collective timeline, to shape our beliefs and our perceptions regarding them, so that if show they you know reveal themselves, we are more cooperative and more primed to be taken in by them. So the aliens are more heavily involved in spreading disinformation, or you know, or, keen, or even good knowledge, depending on whether it's a negative or positive alien faction. But they're, they're more involved in info wars and uh, manipulating people's expectations, and also testing them experimentally. Like what you mentioned with aliens giving false dates, um, some of that, some of that I think might be energy feeding as well, because. See, because the thing is, you know, in this talk, that this discussion that we're having, I'm talking about aliens and occult entities as their 100% distinct separate categories. But the thing is, there is a blended area in the middle, just as with humans, right? There are some humans who are possessed by these dark entities. Well, it stands to reason that perhaps some aliens might also be hosts for dark entities. And in that sense, let's say the, uh, the reptilian types, right, which are known for being highly sadistic, uh, for rape scenarios and things like that, they act very much like demons do. Only thing is, we know from these abduction uh, encounter, uh, encounter reports that these reptilians seem to have uh, a tangible component to them, you know, and they do have some level of technology. So it seems to me, I mean, if I had to make a hypothesis, I would say that certain reptilians might be biologically engineered hosts for demonic entities, and that they're acting out, you know, the same same agenda just in an alien form. But uh, I think those are in a small minority, and that the vast majority of occult entities are on Earth. Uh, you know, doing this whole dark ghost demon, manipulate the humans, feed off them, that kind of a spiel. Compared to aliens, at best, I think occult entities might seek to create a, uh, a cult of followers, for example, that they can feed on, or, or even create an entire religion if they want to. Or they can get their hosts to set up, say, a torture dungeon that they can hang out <laughs> in. Or, or they can instigate wars and genocides even. I mean, I'm sure that's happened throughout history. And I think that's as far as their ambitions go. Whereas aliens... Uh, they seem to want um, control of the future of our entire species. And so their ambitions are a lot higher, and it has a lot more finesse and calculation to it. All right, so the false storylines that um, the aliens convey, or that the aliens do, uh, they're more calculated toward that end. And, you know, they're, they're a bit slicker and more, I guess, produced. You could say almost like a produced song. Just There's more of a production behind it because they're smart overall and they have more resources and, and so on. And, and also, another thing I wanted to mention is that aliens generally seem to have a better ability to view the future. I don't know if it's because they're time travelers or they can view outside time or maybe they're just extremely psychic. But compared to occult entities, uh, yeah, they, they have a, a longer range of view into the future and they're always mindful of the future and they're always trying to manipulate things in the present towards the future. So, you know, if humanity were to undergo some sort of upheaval or cataclysm in our near future, uh, I think... I think it would be in the aliens' best interest to uh, cry wolf regarding that, which, is, which would be almost like uh, throwing a smoke bomb in order to get people disillusioned and always hinging on the wrong dates and stuff, and you know, keeping them, um, leading them around, as well as monitoring their psychological reactions to what might be, might be going on. So yeah, I think, 
I think if there is going to be a cataclysm that uh, both occult entities and the aliens would stand to profit from um, running little little things where you know people are told the wrong date and uh, getting disillusioned over and over again. Uh, I think there's a strategic value to that. Yes, we see that where certain people that are in the field doing what we do, essentially, they they believe implicitly in what they're being told by their guides, by their friendly ETs, perhaps by these occult entities, what have you. And then when they make all these predictions based on the information they've been given and, and it doesn't come to pass, then, well, they have an option. Either they say, well, mea culpa, I don't know why it didn't happen, it was supposed to, but it didn't, and maybe the, the entities will come up with an explanation why, but... Sometimes a lot of these people that are putting out dates and putting out these predictions, they wind up with egg on their face sometimes uh, from buying into what these entities are telling them. Yeah, yeah, I would say that the vast majority of such cases are most likely occult entities pretending to be aliens. And the reason I say that is because a lot of these predictions happen through channelers. Yes. Okay. And channelers are, are <laughs> it's, they're, they're some of the most, I mean, they're, they're like, they're like, a, like a bullhorns <laughs> for, for these occult entities to kind of speak through. And uh, you know, gather a sizable audience hanging on their every word. Yeah, and, and so these these channelers they tend to be used, and then thrown away, and then another person gets selected to be the next prophet, and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, the other interesting thing is regarding that is um, this odd psychological thing where the people that hang on to these predictions are you know are part of a religion or part of a cult that hinges on a date. When that date comes and goes. You would expect these people to say, oh, okay, I guess that was a big load of baloney, so um, I'm going to go, we're going to go separate ways. But no, actually what happens is a lot of them, uh, they double their faith and their belief in that system. And they try to try even harder to get other people to join that system. And the reason for that is because, well, okay, now that the date's come and gone and they're feeling a little bit insecure, uh, now they've got to try to recoup that by reinforcing their own belief and their own faith and getting other people to join to act as... Um, as confirmation for themselves and validation. So, in a sense, this whole thing about uh, false dates, it can also act as a, as a means of increasing um, subordination and submission and uh, faith in that particular belief system. So that's another um, angle to it, too. That's a very good point. Uh, in the time we have left in, in the first hour, what can you tell us as far as the, the key indicators of, of occult entity deception? Are, are there, by now a number of identifying factors which would suggest somebody is going through an occult entity deception. Okay, yeah, sure. To, all right, so to summarize, because, you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of things here, and, uh, yeah, it's good to get a little recap on that. I've kind of boiled it down to eight key signs that indicate an occult entity deception. All right, so first is that what the person sees and experiences as part of a projected hallucination, it has no objectivity to it. Like, like for example, I mentioned if a, if a real okay, if a real alien ship were hovering over a street, uh, there would most likely be multiple eyewitnesses. You know, the crickets would stop chirping. There, you know, there might be a rumble, lights. You know, other objective things happening that um, can be verified. Whereas in a hallucination, obviously the environment is unaffected by any of it because it's only happening inside the mind. So this lack of objectivity is one of the the, the key signs that you know it's it's a hallucinating, um, a projected hallucination by these entities. All right, so. Second um, is that if there, if, there, if there is any objectivity to an occult entity experience, it's only the kind of things that um, one would expect for a paranormal presence. So, you know, things like seeing dark shadows moving around in the room or uh, poltergeist-type stuff or bruises and welts appearing on the body while a person is awake. You know, because normally when you get a bruise or a mark, and you've been asleep, okay, well, maybe you were abducted, maybe you weren't, but if you're awake and this kind of stuff happens, then obviously it wasn't aliens. So, you know, in those cases, it most likely was an occult entity. And my mom, actually, uh, back in 1983, I remember when I was, I was only three years old at the time, yeah, we are watching TV, and this huge swollen handprint appeared on her thigh. Wow. Yeah, it had six fingers, and each joint, uh, each finger had four joints. <laughs> it was insane, and it was like twice the size of, of a normal human hand. And uh, I have a picture of it. Um, yeah, th that was pretty crazy. And at the time, you know, we had a lot of paranormal stuff going on. Uh, this was in our apartment in Germany. So we had that. And, and she also had uh, alien abduction symptoms as well, and, and so did I. So we kind of had the full, the full gamut of weirdness. And, and that's what I meant earlier in the show when I, when I mentioned my, uh, my history a little bit. And 
and how had weird things happen and how they kind of spurred me into wanting to research a lot of this. All right, so the third key indicator would be that uh, that there's no sign of physical abduction or physical medical procedures being done. All right, so like, for example, there'd be no implants, there'd be no scars, uh, no scoop marks, uh, no phantom pregnancies or nosebleeds, missing time or screen memories. Those traits, from what I can tell, are, are pretty much exclusive to aliens and, well, and also military type abductions, like, you know, my labs. Yeah, so, but as far as, like, occult entities go, nah. I don't think they're really capable of that kind of stuff. I mean, they can, they can do the etheric burns, you know, which are, like, bruises, and they can do the welts on the skin, which are uh, allergic reactions to their, uh, their, their toxic etheric energy field. But um, as far as the more physical things, they're not, they're not really capable of it. So, you know, if a person doesn't have any of these alien abduction symptoms, but they have other things going on, then maybe, maybe it is an occult entity situation. All right, so the fourth sign is that there's almost constant activity versus the more intermittent stuff that aliens are known for. And, and the reason why that is is because occult entities, as I mentioned, they can set up a, uh, a nest in a home, and they can, or, or you know, they can latch onto a person and follow that person around 24-7. Whereas the aliens, uh, at least in my experience, they seem to kind of come and go as their mission and their logistical uh, limitations require. So, so if it seems like a person or place has become infested with paranormal activity, where it's on like all day long and all night long, then it's probably not aliens, because it seems to me that aliens probably have better things to do than just camp out in a home for years at a time, you know? So, yeah. So, the, anyway, so the fifth one is, uh, is that what these beings say and what they show that it's all part of a, a false storyline containing way too many uh, fantastical elements, you know, a lot of which seem to be drawn from the person's own subconscious. So it's not that the victim is necessarily fabricating it, but it's that these entities are fabricating it and that they're taking cues from what they can read in, uh, in that person's soul or, you know, from the souls of others that they have experience with. And I, and I think that's why if the storyline imitates the alien theme. It's going to ape it in a uh, cartoonish or caricaturized way because these occult entities are not experts on aliens and they only seem to know of the alien phenomenon by proxy, okay? So the sixth uh, indicator would be that these false storylines contain spiritual disinformation, first and foremost, underneath it all. Uh, you know, things that would weaken a person against uh, further occult entity feeding and manipulation, and, uh, and that would include making a person more likely to uh, get ensnared after death, even, by these entities. So, you know, one thing you might notice, one thing I notice is uh, these occult entities, especially some of the demonic ones, they seem to be pretty heavily vested uh, in propagating this information that makes a person have a very wrong uh, expectation of the afterlife or what happens after death. And the purpose of that would be to, to kind of lure that person into becoming another dark ghost. In other words, to die and then kind of go astray, become an earthbound spirit, not go where you should be going, and then get taken in by these demonic entities who then put that ghost uh, to service, you know, haunting and feeding off the living. It's kind of like the mafia taking in, you know, street thugs and, and so on. Um, it's kind of sad that it happens, but there's a lot of afterlife research, uh, past life regressions and so on, that suggests, you know, this sort of thing goes on. And, and also, like, with people who do spirit um, entity releasement, that's where you hypnotize a person and you get them to go deep into their soul and then you find out what sort of discarnate entity attachments this person has and then you kind of talk to that being and you convince it to leave and then miraculously that person gets uh, healed of so many different symptoms and you know uh, dysfunctions which were actually being induced by this attached entity. So that's the sort of uh, um, aberration that can happen with living humans who die and don't go where they're supposed to go. And, uh, you know... That's, that's the sort of spiritual disinformation that these occult entities try to propagate, things that would lead to that. You know, another example of that would be the whole idea about um, the light being a trap. You know, I'm mean, sure you've, you've heard of that. Yes. Yeah, and, you know, that's possible. It's, it's possible. On the other hand, when I look at the people that are propagating that idea, that are saying it, or who, or who said it first, I notice some very glaring vulnerabilities in their methodologies. Okay, for example, remote viewing, right? Remote viewing, the only requirement for that is that multiple remote viewers come up with a similar data set. So they all tap into a, a, a subject, which they don't even know yet, but they all you know, get the information from it and the notes are compared. And then if their notes match of what they picked up on, well, 
that seems to be what indicates objective truth in the remote viewing community. But it's not that simple because an alien or an occult entity can easily stand in that room and project telepathically into the mind of each person a certain detail. Okay. So it's very easy to corrupt that field of research simply by faking uh, or by mimicking objectivity simply by you know, dropping the same thought into the minds of multiple remote viewers. And uh, so with remote viewing, when it comes to things like, oh, where's this body located or uh, what's really going on in Russia you know, or what's going on in Mars, or, you know, that sort of stuff, it's not really consequential to these occult entities. But when it concerns things like the afterlife and so on, then they realize that there's an opportunity to sow disinformation. And that's why in those cases, I think it's uh, possible and even likely that such information is corrupted. Uh-huh. So that's why I don't really trust some of those sources that say that the light is a trap because anyone who believes that and, you know, avoids the light and kind of goes left, right, up, down, whatever, uh, that typically, if, if you if you look at cases where, uh, like, the spirit and entity releasement, where they start talking to these entities that are attached, these entities get questioned on, on where they went astray or, or how, how they became that way. And uh, a lot of times it's revealed in the end that these entities did not go into the light. And actually going into the light is how these entities typically are uh, removed from that person. So, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of suspicious to me that this idea goes around that the light is a trap. Because if it's not, then it would be one of the most effective lies you could say to people to get them to uh, become more food for these uh, discarnate demons, right? <laughs> that's a very good point. Yeah, so, yeah, um, so that's, that's an important point. Um, oh, yeah, and the seventh indicator, which I need to get into, is that the person may not ever have had a history of alien abduction or contact. Okay, I mentioned that a bit earlier. And now... Healing activity, you know, usually it begins from a very young age, like two years old, you know, even even younger. Uh, mine, for example, started uh, in infancy, you know, because I, I can remember pretty far back in time in my life. And I remember things from when I was six months old, uh, two months old, uh, or I'm, I'm two years old, sorry, uh, three, all the way up to about age four, as far as alien abductions went. And they're really frequent back then, too, you know. But occult entities, deception... Um, and that can really begin at any time. I've gotten emails from people who have had no uh, history of alien abduction or contact whatsoever, who started getting this occult aliens or this occult entity stuff in their 30s or 40s or even 50s. So it can happen suddenly, you know, at the right moment of psychic vulnerability. You know, it can begin any time. Uh, you know, one day the victim just hears a voice or has an entity come to him or her with some big story to tell. It, it can just happen just like that. And you know, that person may. Like I said, may show no sign of prior alien activity in life. Uh, and actually, I think it's I think it's rare for aliens to come into a person's life suddenly later on in life. And I think why that is is because aliens can most likely already tell from the time you're born what your potential is, and whether you're of any use or threat to them. So alien activity, you know, if, if they either get you when you're young or, or they don't, um, or they don't get you at all. So I think alien activity usually begins from a pretty young age. And um, the thing is, occult entities, they can also step in at a young age, but it's not really a strategic requirement for them. It's more like a, it's more like a convenience. You know, kind of like, a, like hey, you know, we, we have a human child on, on, on Fifth and Mulberry who has a second sight. Let's go and spook him and, and, and feast on his fresh, juicy energies. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if that's what they're really saying or thinking, but it's just kind of like how I like to comically portray them in my mind. Yes, it's like opportunistic infections almost. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. They, they see a little babe for the taken, and, and that's what they go for. Whereas aliens, they look at a baby and they say, oh, okay, we're reading his soul. We're scanning his probable futures. Okay, threat, 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 threat. Let's go, you know, program him and try to deviate him in life so that he doesn't fulfill his potential. That's, I think that's something that happens. I think that sort of tried to happen with me. But thankfully, because I did a lot of research and maybe I had help from other sectors outside this universe, maybe you know, I was able to make it through and, and uh, live long enough to help out people who read my site, you know, with, the, with this, you know, critical information. So anyway, you know, that aside, you know, the, I want to finish up with the, uh, the last indicator, which is that the person might begin developing schizophrenic type symptoms, but the symptoms tend to go away if the entities are removed from his vicinity or he goes somewhere else, which doesn't make sense if it's actual schizophrenia, because, I mean, that's, a, that's something that's in the brain, right? I mean, supposedly. But if it's an entity thing, then you take away the entities, then the person's fine. And I've, I've come across cases precisely of that. Uh, for example, I know a woman who, uh, when she was younger, she picked up an occult infection during a certain uh, ritual being conducted on her by a person who, it turns out, he was infected or she was infected. 
And in the following decades, unfortunately, she was being tormented by these voices, by pokings and proddings by these entities. Uh, and they, they put her through hell and they ruined her life, you know, to, to a degree. Well, one day, her apartment burned down and she moved to another part of town. <laughs> and the voices and the sensations suddenly stopped. I mean, they pretty uh-huh. much lost, but stopped. So it was uh, p- peculiar to a particular locale then in that instance. Exactly. And it's, yeah, right. It's probably because the entities had set up a nest of some kind in her apartment, which she had been staying at for a very long time. And they were using this nest to more intensely mess with her. You know, it's kind of like, um, you think about, it's kind of like fish or like snails. You know, they, they need to have moisture in order to operate and go places. Well, these occult entities, to a degree, they need to saturate the local environment with their own dark, toxic energies in order to make it more comfortable for themselves. And so the more a place is saturated like that, the more strong these entities are. And typically, a person in that area will be increasingly manipulated, tormented, uh, feel sick. You know, you'll feel like a dark and heavy, oppressive energy. Yeah, so that, I think that's what was happening in her case. And when she moved to the new place, uh, these entities had nothing set up there, and perhaps they didn't even follow her there. And therefore, you know, curiously, she was... Uh, she was free of that. Yeah. Well, we've reached the end of the first segment. You've been listening to Tom Montauk talk, talking about occult entities masquerading as aliens and how to discern between an actual alien encounter or encounters and the malign actions of these occult entities. Uh, we have uh, Tom has a, much more to share with us in the second hour of the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Our show is uh, subscription and listener-driven, so if you want to listen to Part 2, please go to the website, thecosmicswitchboard.com, and sign up and become a member. So uh, with that, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back at the top of the hour with Part 2. <laughs> 